Thanks for being here this morning, y'all. Many of you know that uh, that we record the sermons and they're uploaded to YouTube and, uh, and put on Facebook. And main purpose of that is not to uh, to to tout you, Pastor Doug, in, in anything at all. It's to to edify the body of Christ and to glorify the kingdom. And uh, I have many. Facebook friends from uh, the various places that I have lived, and so uh, it is my prayer that uh, maybe even just one of the messages that uh, we deliver here at Woodland Trails would reach someone who doesn't know the Lord, and they just might happen to click play and watch part of it and uh, maybe come to understand the truth. And so join with me in praying for the lost. Father, we just come together here as the body of Christ this morning to worship you in everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think, Lord. And as, as we come together during this time of, of worship and sermon, and it is a time of worship as we, as we study your word, as we go to your word and, and help, it, help us to understand what it says, help us to understand what it means, and help us to understand what it requires of each of us individually and to act on that, Father, in a manner that glorifies you and that furthers your kingdom. Fill us with your spirit so that we can accomplish this. We praise you and worship you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, what, is, what is the reward of fear? What's the reward of fear, of anxiety, stress? Acute stress can provoke changes in the heart that may lead to death. Say, doctors Marilyn S. Salibulin and of Cleveland and Charles S. Hirsch of Cincinnati, the two doctors recently identified 15 cases in which people died after a physical assault, although the injuries alone would not have been enough to kill them. 11 of the 15 cases showed a type of heart cell death called myofibrillar degeneration similar to a reaction in, an, in experimental animals who are helpless to anticipate or avoid danger. What's the reward of fear? On the other hand, Augustine said this, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that thou mayest believe, but believe that thou mayest understand. Martin Luther said this, God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything. And whoever does not have faith will have nothing. Folks, we need to understand that we should never fear during the storms of life. Because Jesus is with us all the time. He is God. Our goal today is to realize that Jesus expects, and then we'll see in the text, this is an expectation. He expects his disciples to have faith that he is there with them, with us, in the most threatening circumstances. And so we need never fear. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you will, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. As we continue our study of the Gospel of Matthew, we're in chapter 8 today. Beginning in verse 23, I'll read if you'll follow along. Matthew 8, 23. And when he, Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea Obey him. And God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our context, Matthew, we know that Matthew writes his gospel directed at Israel. 
God's chosen people. And his purpose in writing Matthew is to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is their promised Messiah. And so he goes back to the Old Testament, referencing the Old Testament regularly to demonstrate, see, here's a prophecy that was in the Old Testament written hundreds of years ago, and boom, Jesus fulfills that prophecy. We see that today, and many scholars, as they read through this text, as they go back to the original language, the Greek, and they break apart, and they look at the, the direct object, and they look at the verb tense, and they look at all of the various things that are being said here, they see that this is a demonstration of Jesus' authority, and it is, in fact, a demonstration of Jesus' authority, even over nature itself. And for the most part, as folks study this passage, they will look upon this and say, see, this is another demonstration of Jesus' authority. This is a demonstration that Jesus is God. And that's true. That's very true. But I have to tell you, as I, was, as I was ferreting through this text this week, many of you know that, that we, we use inductive Bible study here to study like passages and allow the Bible to interpret itself. Many people will look at this text and they'll look at the, the statement that Jesus makes about faith and they'll make some assessments about it that are incongruent with other components of the Bible. Let's go back, if you will, together and look at verse by verse, if you will. Just look at verse 23. And when he, Jesus, got in the boat, his disciples followed him. Remember, we just came off of a passage last week where we looked at this text where there were some folks that say, I'll follow you wherever you go. And basically, Jesus says in a certain very loving response, no, you're, no, you're not going to follow me. I know you're not going to follow me. And yet we went back and looked at other passages with the disciples where Jesus pointed at them and said, follow me. And boom, immediately they followed him. And here again, they follow him. Now we recall as we study the passages that lead up to this, the disciples that were called were basically predominantly fishermen. That was their trade. They had a very clear understanding of fishing, of boating, of being in the water. They, they knew that, this, that storms could come up very quickly on this, this lake or, or on this sea. And so they, they understand all of this. And so they get, they get in the boat and it says, and behold, look at, look at the next verse, verse 24. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. And look what it says. So that the boat was being swamped by the waves. This storm, friends, was so paramount, it was so great that the waves were crashing over into the boat. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise. I don't know if you've ever been out in a boat. One time we went deep sea fishing. And we got out there, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, deep sea fishing. You know, you get on this boat with you and like four other people. You know, it's one of these, uh, you know, boats. Maybe it's like 35 feet long and so forth. And they give you these big, long, long poles, and you throw them out there in the back, and you pull in like a sailfish, right? And the sailfish is jumping through the air and everything. That, to me, that was deep sea fishing. Well, we get on this boat. And it's just like this, this row of seats all the way down both sides of the boat. And there's like 150 people on the boat. And they give you this little tiny fishing rod and you stick it in there in the water right in front of you there when the other people's wire, their lines are crossing over your lines and so forth. And so here we are out in the, out in the ocean and we're like, water, sky, water, sky. And that was, that was our experience deep sea fishing. But the waves were, were, were so great in, in this that all we did was just sit there and toss back and forth. But I can tell you, friends, I was not fearful because the waves were not crashing over into the boat. Here, we've got fishermen who are in a boat where the waves are crashing over into the boat so much so that they've been out in the water. They understand fishing and they understand boating and they're afraid. Rightly so. They're going to die, they think. They say, Man, we're going to die. Jesus, look, what's Jesus doing? He's in there with them, holding, locking on arms. Oh, my goodness. No. Look what he says. And they went and woke him. Why? Because he was asleep. Look back. So the boat was being swamped with waves, but he, Jesus, was asleep. Interesting. I don't know. Maybe, you know, we could speculate and say maybe he was just really that tired that the, that the storm didn't wake him up. We don't know. Text doesn't say. Text isn't clear. Nevertheless, Jesus is asleep. Is he worried? Are you, if you're asleep, are you worried? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. 
So he's asleep. And they went and woke him and said, and he said, and said to him, when they woke him, he said, save us, Lord, we are perishing. What did they say? Look at the verb tense. We are perishing. Save us, Lord, we're dying. We're dying. There's impending death here. They're afraid for their lives. You ever been afraid for your life? You ever been in a situation and the adrenaline just flows through you because you know what? You could die right there. You ever been there? Here they are in that situation. And they turn to Jesus asleep in the boat and say, save us, Lord, we're perishing. And what is, look what he says to him. His response is, why are you afraid? Is that outrageous? Here they are in the middle of the sea. Waves are crashing over top of the boat. It's obvious to all that they could all be, be drowned. And Jesus' response is, why are you afraid? And then you know what he says? He chastises them and says, you of little faith. You ever been in that situation where you look at the circumstances and it is obvious to you that it's this. And you have this paradigm in your mind. This is the way things are. And then someone's response to you is, how ridiculous is that? Or you're wrong. You're mistaken. And wouldn't it be outrageous for them? What, what do you think the disciples did? They turned to each other and go, what? What do you mean? Why are, why are you afraid? We're, we're in the boat in the middle of the sea, Jesus. We're in the boat and water's crashing over. We understand that we're going to die here if something is not done. And his response is, why are you afraid? Now, friends, we know Jesus is God. They don't at this point. And by, well, how do I know that? I'm glad you asked because the text tells us that at the end. We'll get there. But here we have Jesus who says, why are you afraid? What does that mean? He's God. He's God. And if God makes a statement, why are you afraid? What is he saying? There's no reason to be afraid. No reason to be afraid in this situation. And then he rips them hard. You of little faith. Anybody, anybody ever said that to you? Oh, you, you just really weak in the faith. That make you feel good? What, is, what should it do? You think it might have hurt their feelings? Was he worried about hurting their feelings? What should it have done? What if they should have looked at the situation and said, Okay, he's, he's master. He's, he's, we're following, he's a teacher, he's rabbi. He said we shouldn't be afraid. And then he's told me I don't have faith. And if I had the faith, then I wouldn't be afraid. So the response of the disciples, should, we don't see what the response, we don't see it. But what, they, what should they have lovingly responded with? Gee, I guess you're right. I shouldn't be afraid. Why was I afraid? Because I didn't have faith. What is faith? We need to dissect that, friends. Because scholars will argue this back and forth about what he's talking about here. But we need to use our inductive Bible study to compare like Bible passages in order to let the Bible interpret itself. Let's keep going. Why are you afraid? Oh, you a little faith. And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now, as we look at this, the English doesn't do it enough justice. What, it, what it's saying here is not only did the storm stop, but the water automatically just calmed and, and was, it was placid. So it was an instant miracle. This was, it, wasn't, it just didn't stop the storm. Hey, you know, if you've ever been out in the ocean, a storm stopped. There's still turmoil for you know, maybe days, even days afterwards sometimes, depending on where you are in the ocean, right? In the sea here. But immediately there was this placid calmness. And as you might imagine, any of us that would have seen that and witnessed that, they turned to each other and look what they say. They marveled saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and the sea obey him? They did not know he was God yet. They didn't know. They're not indwelled with the spirit yet. 
Remember later on Jesus said, and Jesus says, who, who do you think I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. True fact. They didn't recognize that he was God yet. But they marveled at that. And most people will point to this and say, see, that's another fulfillment of prophecy. And that's true. It is. It's another fulfillment. Matthew's purpose is. But the one main point that we need to walk away from here with this is we need to understand what Jesus means when he says, why are you afraid, you of little faith? They're dying. They are in mortal peril. It is obvious that the circumstances of their life are putting their life in danger. And Jesus' response is, why are you afraid? Let's look at that. Circumstances of our life. Some scholars would look at this and they would say, well, you know, see, if they had enough faith, then they could have calmed the waters. I'm sorry. You and I aren't God. Sorry. We, that, that's, not, that's not what that means. And prosperity gospel folks will take that and twist it and say, the reason why you're in such a, such a situation in your life, why, things, why the wheels are coming off, is because you don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, everything would be well. Is that true? No. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches. God is not a vending machine. We've talked about this. He's not a vending machine. You don't say, I want Cheetos, A17. Okay, it says I need $1.50. I put my $1.50 in. I hit A17. I get my Cheetos. No, that's not God. God's not a genie in a bottle. You don't rub the lamp, get the all-powerful out, and say, I got my three wishes here. I was here three out of four Sundays. I serve sometimes if I can. So, Lord, why aren't you doing what I want? That, does, does, that even, that is, does that even get into congruence with God? Listen, friends, we need to understand that you and I are finite beings. We are limited in our understanding. And no matter how much we grow, no matter how much we understand about God, we will never understand all of him. But one thing that we will understand as we grow is that he is not limited. He is unlimited in his knowledge. He is unlimited in his power. He is unlimited in his benevolence, in his perspective over everything. He is unlimited. And when we recognize this, we read this passage in a completely different way and say, if you and I are the disciples in the boat... This might be the day that I'm going to go on to glory. Lord willing, he'll deliver me. Lord willing, he won't. Either way, I'm not afraid. It's all good. Why? Because God is omnibenevolent. And his way is the best way. Come what may, come what might, his way is the best way. And I trust him over me. All my friends, hear me well. Hear me well. Here in America, we are a people who wants to be in control. We are a people who wants everything the way we want it. And postmodernism has twisted our perception of things to where we think we know everything. We got all the information at our fingertips, and we have these paradigms and these perceptions about how we think the world should be and how we think things should be for you and I. And when they don't line up with that, we're unhappy and we're upset. But here, we get the message clearly. You're not in control. You're not in charge. There's nothing the disciples could have done to stop that storm from drowning them. But they needed to be okay with that this was their day to go on to eternity. That that was God's purposes. They needed to be okay with it. And when we make the transition from Whatever happens, this way or that way, whatever happens is the best way because God is sovereign and he is omnibenevolent and he knows best is, when, is the day when our fear goes away. Amen. Do you trust him? Do you trust his purposes? 
Do you trust the circumstances of life to bring about God's purposes? Or are we myopically looking at our own set of circumstances and where we are and what we want and what's going to make us happy and what's going to make us seem like everything is well? Or are we looking at the big picture like Romans 8.28 says? And we know. Who's he talking to? Friends, we study Romans. He's talking to believers. And we believers know that God causes, doesn't allow, God causes all things to work for good. For those who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son. What does that say? We're going to break that up. We know that God causes all things to work for good. Are all things good? Is getting cancer good? Is it losing a job good? Is losing our home good? Is having rebellious teenagers that don't do what you say and run off and, and, and run away and you never see them again good? Well, that's not what it says. It said God causes all things to work for good for those who love God. Who's that? Believers. Those are called according to his purpose. Who's that? Believers. For those he foreknew, who's that? Believers. He also predestined to do what? To be conformed into the likeness of his son. Friends, everything that happens to you and to me as believers is designed to shape you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Is that good? You betcha. You betcha. Is it painful sometimes? Yeah. Is it catastrophic sometimes? It is. It is. But do you trust him? Do you trust him? That's what he means by faith. The stronger our faith, the less our fear. Why? Because come what may, come what might, God is in charge. He's in control. He knows best. And so whatever happens, his way is the best way. I need not fear. The God of all creation knows what's best. Hallelujah. I think Oswald Chambers embodied what I'm trying to say very well when he says this. Faith for my deliverance is not faith in God. Faith means whether I am visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. There are some things that are only learned in a fiery furnace. Remember the reference? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They're standing there. King says, bow down to my statue. And they say what? We will not bow down to your statue. And he says, well, you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. And their response is, our God is able to deliver us. And then they say, and he will deliver us. But even if he does not, we will not bow down to your statue. That's faith. A trust in the Lord God and his way and his purposes, holding true to him and him alone. Brett Blair said this, Faith understands that God intervenes in the natural course of events. He did that in today's text. On the other hand, if the natural course of events should happen to answer prayer, that which we call coincidence, faith still believes that God is present. Had that been the day of their death, God's still in charge. God's still present. God's way is the best way. So, Jesus and the disciples, they, they get into a boat. They go out, they're crossing the sea. 
A storm comes up. The waves are crashing over top of the boat. The disciples are fearful of their life. They wake up Jesus, ask him to save them. Jesus' response is, why are you afraid? You have little faith. He reaches out his hand, and as God Almighty calms the waters, at which they marvel, who is this man that even nature obeys him? What's our takeaway? What do we do as, as a result of this? Dr. Stanley E. Jones said this, I'm inwardly fashioned for faith, not fear. Did you know that? That's the way you're wired. We're wired for faith, not fear. Fear is not my native land. Faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, doubt, and anxiety. In anxiety and worry, my being is gasping for breath. This is not my native air. But in faith and confidence, I breathe freely. This is my native air. Faith. A Johns Hopkins University doctor says this. We do not know why it is that worriers die sooner than non-worriers, but that is a fact. But I, who am simple of mind, think I know. We are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain and soul, for faith and not for fear. God made us that way. To live by worry is to live against reality. Are you worried? Are the circumstances of life pressing down on you? Do you feel like the wheels are coming off? Do you feel like you're gasping for breath? Oh, friends, God is in charge. He's got you. He's got you. When a traveler in the early days of the West came to the Mississippi, he discovered that there was no bridge. Fortunately, it was winter, and the great river was sheeted over with ice. But the traveler was afraid to trust himself to it, not knowing how thick the ice was. Finally, with infinite caution, he crept on his hands and knees and managed to get halfway over. And then he heard, yes, he heard singing from behind. Cautiously, he turned, and there, out of the dusk, came another traveler driving a four-horse load of coal over the ice, singing as he went. Are we living in faith? Or are we living in fear? It's still a choice. Here's my challenge. During our daily quiet time, I want us to examine our responses to the times where we felt like the wheels were coming off, where it looked like everything was just coming unglued. Maybe you're going through that right now. Where did our hope come from? Where does our hope come from? Where are we seeking hope? Ourselves? Our abilities? They will fail. Or Jesus? Remember this, just back to the book of Daniel. It's robust with truth. Robust. Daniel, if you read the book of Daniel, you'll never see where Daniel stepped out of line, not even once. From the time that he was a teenager to the time he was a very old man, there's no rendering of, of Daniel's tripping and falling or faltering at all. But if we remember, back when Daniel was just a teenager, the text tells us, and Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. If we break that down, really what we're seeing here is Daniel decided in advance that he was going to be obedient to God. His obedience, his acquiescence, even in the face of things that didn't make sense. And we see that even in the face of mortal danger, the faithfulness of Daniel. And his buddies persevered. You know, we're seeing a pretty, pretty even balance of, uh, of contemporary music and, and, and hymns here. And try to get a smattering of, of everything. It's not that we're trying to accommodate anyone. But uh, there's an old hymn. It goes like this. When we walk with the Lord in 
the light of his word. What a glory he sheds on our way. Let us do his good will. He abides with us still. And to all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. That's theologically sound, biblically correct, builds up the body and really worships the Lord the way that this passage is teaching us to do. Trust and obey, friends. There's no other way. All the rest of it is fear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together, for your message, Lord. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. It covers and washes away our sin. We are clean before you. Strengthen us today, Lord. Be with us, guide and direct us. Help us to honor you with our thoughts and glorify you with our lives. We praise you, we thank you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We come now to a time of invitation. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you believe the truth about Jesus, that he is God, that he lived the perfect life as the perfect sacrifice, shed his own blood voluntarily on the cross as a satisfaction of God's wrath, as atonement for your and my sin. If you believe that he rose from the dead to prove who he is and or ascended into heaven to see at the right hand of power because he's large and in charge, then you're a Christian. I want to encourage you to come forward today and express that publicly as a public profession of faith. If you want to unite with this beautiful body of believers, the loving church, you come forward as we sing our invitation hymn.